Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Amen. God is so good. Turn to your neighbor and say, He's on your side. <laughs> it's on your side. He's for you, not against you. Amen. All right, let's stand for a second. Take your Bible. Say it with me, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. So we've talked on a lot of different topics uh, as far as God, the, the Lord is working and so forth. But we've talked about change. Now today I want to talk about love and action. And uh, if there's an area in our life that is probably the most critical area to change is the area of love in our hearts toward God and toward people. Galatians 5 just says, uh, talks about the fruit of the Spirit, but it begins with the fruit. It begins with love, all right? 1 Corinthians 13 says a lot of things, but the greatest is love, right? Galatians says faith works by love. So love is a key, key factor in our life. And we can all say we love God. Okay, if we do, if we do, then that should transmit into how we love people. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Now, gifts are given, fruit is growing. So you become a Christian, we surrender to Jesus Christ, we ask Him to be our Lord and Savior, so we receive that saving grace. Now is a process of growth. And growth being that, that we all had an old nature and were forgiven, thank you Jesus, however, now we have to change Look at someone say, change. <laughs> now we have to change to be like who? To be like our Savior, to be like our God, all right? So we are changing, we are changing. And the fruit of this, all these, all these areas here, all this fruit are, are verbs. They require action. Now there isn't any greater action than it says, God so loved the world. And the action then is that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, for our sins, Right? So the action, you know, you can say, and many times we say, oh, I love people, I love this and that. However, it's not the words, it's the action. It's always the action. So all these things, fruit of the Spirit. And if we say, of course, that we're Spirit-filled Christians, then, then, of course, the litmus test is always, well, what is the fruit? What is the fruit? What is the fruit in my life? What do, what do people see in me? Do they see Joy, peace, love, long-suffering, kindness, goodness. Do they see these things in me? Because if we say we're filled with the Spirit, then we're filled with God. We're, we're just overflowing with God. And that's where we want to be, right? Yeah. Then that's what should ooze out of us. It's like a sponge that's so soaked up that when you, if you, if you touch a soggy sponge, it's just sloppy. It, you just, you're going to get wet, Right? So when people bump into us in the or normal everyday of life, what oozes out of us? So this, is, this, sort of, this sort of message, you know, is the sort of thing where we realize, wow, we are in this huge process of change, right? So, so we're, he demonstrated, he demonstrated his love toward us, right? There's, there's, there's action here. 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. So he's the source of... He's the source of this love. God is, right? Yes. And, and so he demonstrated, Romans 5 says he demonstrated his love toward us. Amen. So he demonstrated it while we were enemies, while we were not his friends, while our lives were messed up. So love, love is this great, this agape love, this giving love of God is so huge that it's going out after people that are lost, that are messed up. Amen. So you can, you can, it's not, now we don't want to confuse liking and loving because you don't necessarily like everybody or their mannerisms, but you are supposed to love them because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So fruit then grows, grows on a vine or grows on a tree. So if we're going to 
produce more fruit, if we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, then we have to be attached to the source. Amen? I'm not going to grow the love of God. I'm not going to grow the fruit of the Spirit if I'm attached to the television or my computer that's telling me another message. That's not going to produce this godly fruit. I'm only going to be, uh, grow this fruit if I'm attached to the source, the source of it. Now, John 15, of course, we know these things. But the source of love is Jesus Christ, our God. So he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I in him, you bear much fruit. Now, abide means we're attached, right? So we're attached to Jesus. We're attached to the vine. Remember, remember when it started in John 15, it says, he said, I'm the true vine. There is a false vine. So, so if we're attached to the things of the world, we're trying to suck life off of something that's dead. We're never going to get fulfillment from the world. You're only going to find fulfillment in Jesus Christ. You're only going to find the love of God in Jesus Christ. You're only going to find joy in Jesus Christ. So the world substitutes lots of things. This will make you happy, and this is a good cause. You can do this, but you'll never find life other than in Jesus Christ. So we have must abide. Jesus abides in us. We have to abide in him. If we do, it says we're going to bear much fruit. Now, automatically, you're going to bear a lot of fruit because you're just attached to, boom, this supernatural lifeline here. You're going to bear a lot of fruit. Notice what he says, though. Without me, you can do nothing. So many times our efforts in the natural are producing death because we're not attached to the life. By this, my Father is glorified, verse 8, that you bear much fruit, and so shall be you be my disciples. Now, he wants to produce in us a lot of love. Talking about love, right? Amen. So he doesn't want you to be a little lovey. He wants you to be real lovey. Amen. He wants you to be like him. Amen. How he sees this world. I, God has changed my perspective and keeps changing me so much, you know. Because I could look at newscasts, get upset. I could look at things, oh, they're, they're bad, they're evil, and this and that. And yet it's like the Lord always tempering, but I do love them. Amen. But I do love them. Now, it's one thing to hear that, to say, yeah, oh, yeah, he loves them. Now, let's put the shoe on the other side now to say, and I want you to love them. So the goal, the goal, we're attached to this vine, Jesus Christ, the true vine. The goal is to produce much fruit. Now, the farmer is interested always in producing more crops. You know, any farmer really isn't content. Let, I don't want the same yield I had five years ago. No, I want to, I want to keep increasing my yield. I want a better, a better harvest than I had before. So we go again, John 15, verses 2 and 3. And Jesus says here, a branch in me that, that does not bear fruit stops bearing, he cuts it away, he trims it off, takes it away, he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch, prunes every branch so that it continues to bear fruit to make it more and richer and more excellent fruit. So the thing is, is he actually wants us to produce more and in the process of producing more, he wants to shave off things that are fleshly he wants to shave off bad attitudes. He wants to shave off my old point of view. And he wants me to have his perspective. So he wants, he wants to prune us. Now, we, we think many times in the natural, oh, this is, oh, this is bad. He's going to prune us. And we're always thinking about bad things. And, of course, sadly, the world, the world doesn't understand how God works with people. But he works with us. And that's why, folks, I'm always mentioning being in the Bible, because the pruning is going to come through the Word of God. It's not, the pruning isn't outward circumstances. The pruning comes through the, the life giver, Jesus Christ. So he says, you are cleansed and pruned already because of the Word, which I've given you. So the pruning, here's the pruning process, all right? He's already given us the pruner. If I'm in the Word, then he's going to continue to trim off things. Notice he says, things I've discussed with you. You ever notice, you ever notice Jesus just never got involved in the issues of his day? Nor did the disciples. Their focus was always on the mission, 
always on the great commandment, always on doing what he asked them to do, is which we're going to bring life to the world, right? So, so a farmer wants, wants to produce more. God is interested in producing more love in us. So if I'm not in the Word, then I'm, away, then I'm away from the very source that can help me and so forth, and I'm still, I love Jesus, and we're doing this and that and so forth, and not realizing maybe my actions, my attitudes, the things that I'm doing are actually hurting other people rather than helping or blessing or loving them. They're causing more harm. But in our minds, we love Jesus. And maybe we do. But he wants to prune things. Here's a question. You find yourself in a difficult situation or relationship or anything like that, and you're asking God to do what? Most of the time when we pray, we're asking God to change people, them, or the situation. And a lot of times, it's human nature, see, is to get out of things. I want to get, I don't like those people. I'm going to quit my job. I don't like those people. The problem is you're going to go to another job and there's people there too. So you're never going to get away from the fact that there's people. And one way or another, you're going to have to work with people. You just are. That's, that's the way it is. Pastors leave churches because of people. The only thing is they go to some other place and then there's people. So in, in lots of groups and so forth, the pastor leaves every few years, you know. Because eventually, it's, oh, there's people here too. I'll go on to the next one, you know. So it's human nature to want to get out of situations when I think it's maybe God's nature to want to change us. Then your neighbors say, I think he wants to change you. <laughs> See, I think, I think that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge all the time, say, whether if you're... If you're uh, Married. Well, he's, he works on both of us. How do we have a good marriage? We work at it. It's not like, you know, 20 years past, we got her licked. Nothing, no more problems. No, no, no. You, we communicate all the time. We talk all the time. So that we're on the same page. It takes effort. Right? It takes effort in talking with people. Sometimes people, I, don't, I just don't like that person. I'm just going to avoid them. I'm not sure that's God's plan. I, th I think his plan is, Lord, Lord, help me, help me in this situation. Help me with this person. Help me to respond. Not, it doesn't mean we're rolling over and let people run over us. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean help us to have the eyes of Jesus. Jesus loves people. Amen. He just does. Amen. It's his nature. Right. You know, I mean, I mean uh, you can tell there's nothing in Jesus' heart because even the centurion, now this is this is a guy, who, he's a Roman. Romans are oppressive. They've oppressed Israel. They've occupied Israel. They've done all these things. And the Roman, the centurion, you know, Jesus said, oh, we're not, he didn't say, we're not dealing with those people. Oh, we're not going to deal with those Romans. Certainly not a centurion who's commanded people and probably done all kinds of bad things. Not going to deal with those. You know, Jesus actually marveled. There's twice, twice in the scripture when he marveled, and one of them was with the centurion when he marveled at his faith, like, wow, because the centurion said, hey, I'm a guy under authority. You just speak the word, it'll be done. I understand how this works. So if you speak the word, my servant will be well. And Jesus goes, wow. And there's another time when Jesus marveled, and that was because of their unbelief. So two, two times he marvels. One was with the Roman out here on the outside. The other's with the Jews on the inside. Oh, unbelief. But he never gave up on anybody. He never pushed anybody to the outside. He never treated anybody poorly. He never spoke ill of any person. Amen. Never did that. So we're serving now this Savior, and I just, think, I just think there's so much that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our hearts yet. 1 John chapter 4, we'll go over there a second. This is the love letter. You've had this in the bulletin. The love of God is manifested toward us. God is love. So his love is manifested toward us, that he sent his only son in the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sins. 
So, beloved, if God so loved us, notice, notice the conclusion here. We also ought to love one another. Now, if God loved us while we were sinners, then he wants us to turn around and love other people. So there's a transformation that takes place. We're tr transformed by his love. Now, in his love, there's no condemnation. There's no judgment, right? There's no hate. You don't find any of those things in the love of Jesus. You have the Old Testament, you know, that had all these rules and so forth. And, of course, that's how the Pharisees went. And this person should be stoned and they should be put to death. Somebody was talking to Gandhi one time, a Christian, you know, about our God. They're talking about, about the laws and so forth. And Gandhi said, wow, if we did all those things, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the whole world would be blind and toothless. Remember, Gandhi was the guy who said, I might have become a Christian if I ever met one. Because he always saw a distorted picture of who God was. People were always living, remember South Africa and apartheid was a quote-unquote Christian nation, reformed, and used the Bible to, to oppress black people. Very bad. Very bad. People can take the Bible and make it say anything they want it to say. Very bad. So if you look at the core of it, and then, of course, you get in the New Testament, and you see the nature of our God and how he loves people, Amen. and why we emphasize we're in this new covenant all the time. Amen. We have to get our eyes out of the old and realize what Jesus did for us so that now we can become like his, in his image. Amen. We are to be in his image. Amen. So... When we're in the world now, and all of us will leave this place. When we built this place, we put, we put things over every header, scriptures. Scriptures. Serving window, you know, serve one another in love. All the scriptures like that. They tore it down, they'd, over the, all the headers, they see black markers. Bruce would stand on the, on the ladder and so forth, and I'd have scriptures, what we we're going to put in every place. As you leave the building, the last big header, you know, where you're entering the mission field, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So then the question is, what kind of gospel are you going to preach? Everybody has kind of a slant on their gospel, don't they? So how we, how we convey this is pretty important. Because we have lives in the balance. So we go, we go to John, or Mark chapter 12, where Jesus was talking to the two great, two great commandments here. And it's not complimented, complimented complicated, but he said, you'll love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, your life, with your mind, your thought, your understanding, with all your strength. And the second commandment, you shall unselfishly love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. In fact, Jesus later, or later in the Bible says, if you do these, you fulfill all the law. Amen. It's just like, wow, all those things, you know, you can, you can, you can kind of get buried in Leviticus. So there's things when you're reading your Bible reading schedule, you see Leviticus, you can read it and go to the New Testament and say, thank God we're not living there. Thank God you don't have a bunch of animals in your backyard and things like that. Thank God for the New Testament. So if you do this, you love God. Now, the first has to happen in order for the second to happen. You know, folks, I think a lot of people who call themselves Christians... I wonder if they are, because they hate people. They're angry. They're bitter. They're upset. So they're like this. They pray like this. You know what? It's fun. It'd be fun to see a happy prayer warrior. How about that? How about a happy intercessor? Why should we be happy? Because we have a God who hears us and a God who answers. Intercessors should be happy. Sometimes people talk about tongues. We're, we're going to war in tongues. You don't see that in the Bible. Sorry. Sorry, don't see it in the Bible. Tongues is a prayer language. It's a communication. It's a love language. It's a love language. Hello. It's of the Holy Spirit. God is love. So Christians, and constant, constantly we're being changed. Constantly being changed. 
So when I'm in the Bible and I'm reading, constantly the Lord is, let's clip, cl clip that off. Let's not think that way. I don't want you to clip see that way. I don't want, clip, I don't want you to say that anymore. Well, what, what happens then? I get healthier. In the process, then I start producing more of the fruit of him that he wants me to produce. And we're focusing here just on love, but I mean, these are, these are huge things. So, so there's a proportional relationship. The proportion that you love God is the proportion that you're going to love people. You can't say, oh man, I'm just all, I love him with all my heart. Boy, I don't like those people. We're going to stand against that. And, uh, 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 I think we got to disconnect here. I think, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Only old people understand that, but anyway. <laughs> the relationship, the proportion that I love Jesus is the proportion that I will love people. There's a direct correlation there. Can't get around it, all right? In other words, you cannot minister. We're not going to minister the world with, with, if we have an empty reservoir. We can't do it. I can't give out then what I don't have, right? So Jesus was always saying to the disciples, freely you receive, freely give. What are they giving? They're giving. They're attached. They're just giving what he gave away. In turn, then, you see the New Testament church doing what? They're still attached, giving, because of that relationship. Now, we don't have the benefit of having seen him face to face, but we have the benefit of the Word of God, that by his Word, we can live. James 2, verse 8, says, you'll fulfill the royal law, mentions the royal law, which is what we just read. You will fulfill it when we love your neighbor as yourself. You'll do well. That's a fulfillment. That's a relationship. Comes down to relationships. Amen? Somebody said, as we've quoted in the, in the bulletin, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Love is the only force. I have this on my desk pad on my calendar, I write it every month. Love is the only force, I try to see it every day, is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Amen. Love is the only force that can do that. Love is the only force that can change somebody. Amen. Many folks want to serve God, but only as advisors. Someone said, quit griping about your church. If it was perfect, you wouldn't belong there. <laughs> God himself does not propose to judge a man until he's dead, so why should you? Hello. Some minds are like concrete, thoroughly mixed up and permanently set. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? We should have a little cricket sign. Here, cricket, cricket. You know, cricket's like the nature, whatever. Peace starts with a smile. When we go to other nations, <clears throat> many places we go to, people don't speak English. Nobody speaks English. But the one thing we do, and, and most of the time when we go, we're the only white people there. And so what we do is we walk slow and we smile. It's amazing what it does. And we'll wave. Narrow little streets or so forth. There are people coming out. It's almost like a little parade of two. And we'll smile. Because people are wondering, why are we there? Yeah. And people have angry looks. Like, why are they here? You, know? you, can't, you can't understand them, but we smile, and it's amazing. You know, people smile back. Some of them have no teeth. They'll smile back. It's amazing. You know, people, people will see then, and then they'll go in their little place, and then pretty soon they're hauling somebody out into the street for prayer. In the middle of the street for prayer. It's very nice. Amen. America, America is a nation that is the most blessed nation on the planet. I'm biased, of course, but I'm sure your nations are too, <laughs> where you're listening to us. But we have like everything. 
We have like everything. And yet you see what? How do you see most people? They're angry. They're upset. They're driving angry. It's like you think you're in a race on the freeway. You know, and it's like, it's like Christians get caught up in that same thing. Christians get caught up in the same rat race, which only makes them number one rat. Never helps them. Never blesses them. A lot of church members are singing, standing on the promises, but they're just sitting on the premises. Thank you. All right. We were called to be witnesses, not lawyers and judge, judges. I think we have to remember that. We were called to be witnesses, not lawyers and judges. We've got Christians all over, you know, they're pronouncing judgments and they're doing this. And it's like, I, I always think, well, who are you people? Who, who is this? These, you know, they go to churches and so forth, but you think, that is, doesn't resemble anything of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't resemble anything in the Bible. You had people in the Bible persecuted because of Jesus, and they were still not doing this to other people. Amen. They got their clothes beaten off, they're whipped, they're beaten, they're commanded not to, not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, and they leave and they're rejoicing that they could suffer shame for his name. Amen. Be fishers of men. It says, uh, be fishers of men. You catch them, he'll clean them. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't have to clean them. You don't have to clean them. We, we get in the wrong spot here. All of a sudden, we're, I'll, I'll teach you how to act. And so, so, so. Forbidden fruits create many jams. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. God loves everyone, but probably prefers the fruit of the Spirit over a religious nut. First John 13, let's look at this. These verses stuck out to me when I got saved. And Jesus, so the Old Testament, you have laws. New Testament, we have grace. But there are some commands. And this is a commandment in the New Testament that Jesus gave to the disciples that you should love one another. Just as I've loved you, so you should love one another. Now, some people would say, well, of course, he was talking just to the 12 there. No. He's talking to how he loved the world. He's telling them, you do the same. All right? So just love one another just as I have loved you, which is a whole dose of grace and mercy, right? I don't think any of us are, are perfect yet, right? We're still being worked on. So, so you should turn, so you should to love one another. Now he says by this, by this example of love is how people are going to know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. If you keep showing, keep on showing love, all right, to yourselves. So now here's a command. He's, he's saying, I take this real heavy coming from Jesus. I'm going to give you a commandment. So, Dave, this isn't a suggestion. This isn't just a thought. I want you to pray about it. No. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to command you. And in this case, he might have had his finger out in a good way. Okay, I'm going to give you a commandment. And I'm sure they were, their eyes were locked to his eyes. And my commandment is, I want you to love people the way I've loved you. I want you to give that out because that's the only way this world is going to know that you're my disciples, that you are true Christians. If you love in this way, amen, as I have loved you. So they're attached to the source. The source is Jesus. And he's basically tell them, telling them, he's telling us, you can do this. I look at that, and I'm always getting trimmed. When I go to John 13 and read that, I always get trimmed a little bit. It's a good thing. Galatians 5. So you serve one another. You've served. 
course, we're liberty and so forth. We're led of the Spirit and all this. And many people claim being led of the Spirit, but let me just tell you, the Spirit, of, the, Spirit the Holy Spirit, will never leave, lead you apart from the Bible. So if you're being led in an area that is going to contradict the Bible, then you're not led by the Holy Spirit. That's why you want to know the Bible. Amen? That's why you want to know the Word of God. So if I feel like I'm being led, but it's contradicting what's here in the Scripture, it'd probably be best just to pull up on that horse. Wait a minute. Go a little slower. Call the liberty, but don't use liberty for an opportunity for the flesh. And we see this in our world today, folks. So many people are throwing around the things of the Spirit and so forth, and it's nothing more than an opportunity for the flesh to act up. It says, through love, serve one another. So I like these things that he's putting in here by the Holy Spirit. These things come in here like, no, 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 wait now. If we're in, if we're in, the, Holy, if we're in the Spirit, we have liberty, we need to serve one another with this love. Notice it's with love, and notice it's serving. It's action. All the, all the law is fulfilled in one word. You love your neighbor as yourself. There it is again. If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed one of another. So all of a sudden, now he's addressing Christians. He's addressing the church, and he's saying to the church that you're out here biting and devouring other people in your liberty. In your liberty, in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is saying to me and so forth, and they're biting and devouring people. We don't want to bite and devour people. We don't want to... People, people kill other people with their words. So in other words, if someone was face to face, you're standing face to face, would you say the same thing to them? Face to face. How do we treat people? How do we respond to people? I mean, it's something we've got to think about, right? How do you treat your wife in your home? How do you treat your kids? These, these things are behind closed doors, but obviously how they play out is very, very important in life, right? How do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat the person that maybe isn't so nice at work? Do you know any Democrats? How do you treat them? How do you treat a Democrat? How do you treat somebody that if you do or do not agree with them, how do you treat them? How we treat people is going to be the basis on how we reach people. Understand me? Very important. Even for us here, how we declare the truth of the Word of God, we want to do it with the love of God. We want to do it doing what? Loving people. Years ago, we had someone up here in this pulpit, not me, somebody else in this pulpit, declaring things of the world and so forth, offending by name Democrats. And guess what? We had people here who were Democrats, and they left, and they never came back. And they never came back. And they never came back. And they never wanted to hear the gospel again. And when that happened, I repented. I wasn't preaching, but I repented. Lord, that is so sad. That is so sad. Someone here hears that message. Boom, they're gone. That is so sad. Your life is an example of Jesus Christ. Let's hit the rubber of the road. How do you speak about the president, President Biden? How do you speak about him? How do you speak about Fauci, Dr. Fauci? How do you speak about people that are in office? Think about it now. All of these things go back to our relationship with Jesus. It's not a question of, well, who's right or they're wrong or this or that. No, no, it's all about our attitude. It's about how we extend grace to people. How are we going to love the world if we can't get near the world? As I said before, we've ministered to many people in the gay community. And they keep coming around us because why? Because we love God. 
We don't compromise on sin, but we, we don't, they know also we don't hate them. We're not throwing them under the bus. How we speak, how we act, how you do in private. Tell, people tell jokes and so forth. And they think, I don't want to hear that joke. Yeah. I've heard Christians tell things that I don't want to hear that. Don't, tell, don't talk to me around me like that. It's like, oh, oh Dave's here. Well, I guess we better be careful. Yeah, you better be careful. Because not just me here, Jesus is here. People crack jokes. People say things that are mean-spirited. That's the world we live in. And they bite and devour one another, consumed of one another. And, and the thing is, people think they're right. They think they're right because they haven't gotten close to the vine enough yet to realize, oh, you want to prune that off? Yeah. I want to cut it off. Folks, this goes so many different directions in the body of Christ. You can find the people in the net, the conservative people, don't believe in the Holy Spirit and so forth, but they're loving God and so forth, and they want to shoot at the Spirit-filled people. They want to shoot at the Pentecostal people. Bill Johnson's wife in California, she's fighting for her life. We've been praying with him, standing with Benny and so forth. You can't believe, you go online and you see Christ, Christians in the Christian community Throwing daggers. I don't even think those people are saved. They're getting what they deserve. When AIDS came out, Christians say, they're getting what they deserve. That's, they're getting what they deserve. And I thought, even then, I thought, whoa, 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 what's going on here? I'm not going to have that in the church. I can say that. Are you getting what you deserve? Are you getting with the fruit of your life what you deserve? I think not. We have to be, Christians speak without thinking. And then they speak their Christianese. And then they speak because somehow they've heard from God. I've heard so many things lately, folks, that's from God that I think, woo, 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 woo. wow, I've got to get on the planet here. The Bible is the Bible. The Word is the Word. How we love people, how we treat people. Folks, all around us, you're going to find wrongs and injustices and so forth. That's the world. <laughs> Hello, that's just the world. So how we act or react in the world is important. How am I going to react in the world? How am I going to treat others? Amen? Amen? He who angers you controls you. If God is just your co-pilot, you better swap seats. Let him take over. Prayer, don't, don't give God instructions. Don't give God instructions. Just report for duty. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. It's like, uh, let's see. I'll, take a, I'll come back in an hour when you're done and see if anybody wants to listen to me. Serious, totally serious there. We can't change the message. The message should change us. The best mathematical equation I've ever seen is one cross, three nails equals four given. Who is my neighbor? Well, who's your neighbor? Who's, who are you around? How are we going to relate in the world? Amen? How are we going to relate in the world? What we pray, what we hear from God is what we want to live out in our lives. So prayer is a connecting force to the source of love. We hear from God, and now he says, all right, Dave, you can do it. Now go out there and be that vessel. Be that vessel of change. Romans 13, verse 8, a couple more verses. Ed. We don't want to bite and devour. We've been, we've been, thank God for liberty from debt and so forth, owe no man anything, but we do owe, we owe, this is the one thing we owe, and we owe love, one to another. For he who loves his neighbor, who practices loving others, has fulfilled the law related to one's fellow man, meeting all its requirements. So we owe this love to our neighbor, practicing the love of Jesus to, to the people around us. We owe friendliness. We owe friendliness. You know, just the other night in a ball game. 
I just touch on this, but just the other night in a ball game. So there was people yelling at players, parents yelling at players of the other team, yelling at the other team's players. And so, so, uh, uh, and one of those players was my grandson, a parent yelling foul things. So much to so they went on a security camera and captured the person's face and sent it to the other school. So much the soul, was, so much was the case of animosity that when kids coming through the line to slap hands, the kids went like this, jerked his hand away. I'm not going to shake your hand. Oh, it's all on video. That's the nation we live in. Everybody's got rights. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got this and that. I'm right. You're wrong. It's like, oh, boy. And then what does the church look like? Church looks like the same thing. Looks like the same thing. It's like, what? What? Where, where's the safety point here? It's this relationship with Jesus, how we treat other people. Very, very important. We owe love. That, isn't, that has nothing to do with whether I like the person or not. I owe love. Why? Because I've been given love. He gave me love while I was an enemy. I owe then love back to him and back to people. I owe it. I'm commanded to. It doesn't come down to what I feel. I don't feel led. I don't feel this. It doesn't come down to any of that. It's a choice. I'm going to do what the Bible says to do. You do it. It's like being in the military. You, you might get a, a, a command from an officer, and what are you going to do? You're going to do it. It's a command. And that's what we do here. So we owe this love in our relationship to be friendly, hospitable, compliment people. Amen. Be nice. Turn to your neighbor and say, be nice. <laughs> be nice. Be a nice Christian. Amen. Be a nice Christian. So verse 10. Verse 10 then just says, love does no wrong to one's neighbor. Well, that's, that's kind of the test now. Am I hurting somebody? Am I hurting somebody? It never hurts anybody. Therefore, love meets all the requirements and is the fulfilling of the law. So we have to stop and say, boy, is, it, is this harming somebody? Is this hurting somebody? Am I being critical here, judgmental? Uh, we have to think about it. You know, we, may, we say a lot of things about people, and we're not in their shoes. And years ago, years ago, we were at the Gruens, and we said something to them, and, and they just stopped, and they said, I'm sorry, that's out of my realm of responsibility. Like, they wouldn't give any comment. I thought, wow. And I, and I felt pruned. Because we, give, we freely give opinions, don't we? We give opinions about all sorts of things, and we have... We have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Amen. But we think we have an opinion that matters, so we're going to tell everybody our opinion, but maybe not know the real truth. Amen. Maybe not know the real thing. Amen. So love will not harm anybody. Verse 13 says, love, walk, let's walk properly as in the day, not in Revelry, drunkenness, not in lewdness, lust, and in, in the state of strife and envy. What are we going to do? We're going to walk in love, not in strife. Not in strife. You know, anything that starts criticizing other Christians, you know right away that's of the devil. Yeah. Don't you? Right? You should know that. Anything that's going to criticize Christians is of the devil. And then we have to understand that, that pointing fingers even at the world does the world no good either. It's strife. Verse 14 then just says, here's our, here's our helper here, verse 14, put on Jesus Christ. Well, that's, that's what I, I need Jesus. Well, I need Jesus a lot. Make no provision for the flesh. Why? Because my flesh is very much alive. When we, Romans, Romans 12, we're presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, and we can say, ah, oh, I love that, I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. And what happens? Most of the time, we're crawling off the altar. Uh, that was, that was, we did that. Well, let's get back to work now. Let's go back. And then we're back to our normal selves. Now, if you present yourself as a living sacrifice, you want to stay there. Paul, or in Galatians 2, I'm crucified with Christ. Crucifixion is a process. It's not the end. Death is the end of the process. But I'm crucified with Christ. So I'm putting to death this provision for the flesh 
to fulfill its lust, so I need to put on Jesus Christ. So as I'm crucified, prune, 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 I keep changing. I'm attached. I'm attached to Jesus so I can produce love in all situations. If I'm not attached to Jesus, I mean, I mean, some days might be loving, pass the test, hallelujah, and other days, very carnal, provision for the flesh, fulfilling the lust. What is it? It's a daily walk. It's a daily thing. We're putting on Jesus Christ. We're attached to Jesus, not walking in strife, but continuing to walk with him. So as I'm with the Lord and reading the word, he'll always just work. You know, he works with us, doesn't he? He doesn't ever come like, boy, did you blow it yesterday? Sit down. I got a word to tell you, you know. He's never that way. He's always telling me so much, Dave, I love you. And I always realize, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for loving me. I mean, me. Wow. Just so, so far in need. We all have needs. We have to be dependent upon the Lord. And when we are, then we can produce this fruit Fruit, good fruit for the glory of God. What's the goal then? What does he want to do? He wants us to reach other people, right? He wants us to reach other people with him, with Jesus, with his word. And I think people more and more are going to respond. I think people are going to say yes to the Lord. I believe as the day proceeds here, we're going to see more and more revival. Not just in our land, but all over the world. We're going to see revival. We're going to see things that, that maybe... Maybe the darkness increases, but so does the light. Amen? So grace continues to increase all the time, and the, and the power of God is on our lives. And we're going to be lights for Jesus, and we're going to be vessels to share his love with other people. That's really good. The time, the time one time when a person from the president of the gay league on campus and came to my office and ranted and raved for 20 minutes to my face about everything about the gay lifestyle and Christians and this and that. And so 20 minutes. And I'm listening. And finally they stop. I'm looking at them. They're looking at me. And they said, aren't you going to say anything? Oh, I said, well, you probably think I'm going to, you know, you know, condemn you, curse at you, put you down, going to hell. And I said, no, I'm not going to say that. And they sat up in their chair and they looked at me like, you're not like one of them? And it's like, no, I'm not. They looked at me a little bit more. And they said, well, I will tell you this. I tell, I tell you, Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves you. He still has a good plan for your life. He still wants to do good things in your life. They sat up a little bit more and listened. Why? Because I wasn't wearing the colors of evangelical Christianity. How we deal with people. Oh, boy. No. I want to wear Jesus. Put on Jesus Christ. Put on love. Isn't that right? How am I going to reach a Hindu? How am I going to reach a Muslim? And I've prayed for many, many Hindus. We've prayed for many Hindus. Prayed for us. Can, I, can I just, you know, they want to know who, what we're doing or something. I, we never say we're having meetings, because the police may come, but we tell them we love Jesus Christ. And I say, can I pray for you that he would show you his love? And this is your interpretation. Oh, 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 yeah. So we pray for him, that God would reveal himself to them. Yeah. Amen? Visions, dreams, things like that. Love, love is huge. So let's open our hands here. Father, thank you for love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping us, Lord, to love people around us in our home, at school, on our jobs, our neighbors, whoever we see on TV. Help us to love people. Help us to act like you act. Help us to demonstrate this love. Help us to show us ways to demonstrate this love toward other people, Lord. That they would see you in us. And Lord, that this world around us, that more and more people would accept their salvation, the redemption that you paid for them. Father, we pray for this in the name of Jesus. We pray people's eyes would be open around us. Lord, to the light and the goodness of all that you are, of your wonderful goodness and grace. 
Jesus, I just thank you for you, this anointing on our lives because you are love. So, Lord, just a heavy anointing of love, a heavy anointing of grace, helping us, Lord, not that our flesh would get in the way, <laughs> but that we would think like you think. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, use us. Use us for your glory. I thank you for your anointing on every person here, the people listening, the people who share this message. You can click it and share the message with other people. I thank you for your anointing, Lord, that we as your people can reach this world around us for your glory. Say with me. Say, thank you, Jesus, for this power, this great power of love. Thank you for anointing me, Lord, with your goodness and grace, Father. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can you say amen? Hallelujah.